We have our legislators. They're ready to tell you everything they know and all the success that's going to happen in the 2024 session. Um, and thank you for ending your conversations and grabbing a seat. Okay. Uh, I'm Charlie Baker again. Good to see you all. Um, and thanks for sticking with us all day. Uh, we are at the last session, uh, which uh, wraps up with um, some legislator thoughts. And thank you so much to the, the four legislators that are able to join us today. Um, they're uh, in your program, I'm sure they describe it, uh, Senator Tom Chittenden, Representative Kate Lowley, Representative Emily Krasnow, did I get that right? And uh, Senator uh, Keisha Rahm Hinsdale. So thank, thank you to all four of you for joining us. I am going to not talk very much after this. I'm gonna ask them each, uh, I'm gonna ask the group a question and let each of them respond to it. And then we'll see if we have time for a second or maybe a third question. Um, so with that, um, let's just start off with broad question. What are the transportation challenges you see that need to be addressed? Is this on? Oh, they're great. Uh, hi. So thank you all for being here today and for also listening to me talk a little bit. I've been here uh, attending the sessions and this has been eye-opening. I really appreciated see, hearing from Green Mountain Transit and from Williston as well as all the presentations earlier this morning about the challenges I think everybody in this room are, are quite aware of with regards to how to achieve our climate goals while also addressing the public transportation needs and making it easier, more attractive, more safe, more convenient for people to get out of their single occupancy vehicles and start using public transportation in ways that we we want to want them to um, and since we all agree on where we want to get to I, I think where it comes down and uh, to a lot of problems is how to pay for it and so my mind all day and all for the last couple of years comes to financing there's ways to fund things uh, that we want to uh, that we want to fund one you can take monies away from existing programs and every dollar has a constituency and that's certainly something we can look at and additionally you can raise additional revenues so we could talk about both of those, um, but on the additional revenues front, the one notion that I'm going into this session with, uh, and I serve with Senator Rob Hinsdale on Senate Finance, and this has come up multiple times, but I, I think it also has uh, some legs based on other conversations. Uh, and I also have this, uh, this notion that this is worth considering further from some of my other experiences. I, I served on the South Burlington City Council for eight years. I was also uh, on the Green Mountain Transit Board for about five years. Public transportation needs more funding. Uh, we need to make it more frequent. We need to make it cleaner. Uh, it is very clean. Uh, but to make it more safe and convenient and welcoming. So we need to have the resources to make it that. One notion that I think is worth exploring further is looking at car registration fees to subsidize public transportation. Um, if you want, what I've heard from GMT today, as well as my previous conversations, to get to fare free for the entire state might be an additional um, sustainable recurring two to three million dollars a year. Last year, according to the U.S. Census, or in 2020, the U.S. Census, there were 6,550 cars, uh, 1, 650,000 plus cars registered in the great state of Vermont. I don't know about you, but when you registered your vehicle, it was probably about $200 for two years or $100, it's somewhere in that range. I would support, and have mentioned multiple times, that if we assess or add a $10 public transportation fee on those vehicles, if you do the math, carry the decimal place, that would be approximately $6 million or so that I, I think is a rational assessment. I, I, I'm all about assessments that have a connection to the services that they're going to provide and subsidize. So I, I support exploring this further because individuals, companies, and organizations that choose to register a single occupancy vehicle contributing to our traffic, our congestion that we all want to see less of, um, that are also emitting more climate emissions, I, I feel like those are individuals that for $10 more a year, when they register their car, they can help to subsidize more frequent service, safer service, uh, service uh, that is maybe in electric buses and so on. So I, I really, really want to support further the exploration of a car registration public transportation fee. I don't know how much time I have. Uh, the other thought that I, is on my mind that I'd love to hear thoughts of other legislators too is uh, about land use. And this is a broader scale. The $10 fee on car registration I think is very practical. It's something that we could do. It's, we're already looking at variable rates for electric vehicles in the coming years so I think that's very practical something a little more not pie in the sky but something more that I think we need to consider in the future is parking is not free but too often we think it is as a society so we need to start looking at ways to assess parking so that we put the true cost the not the market rate cost of a parking spot but the opportunity cost of that prime real estate in our downtown areas and if we started to assess or charge um, fees for 
private, uncovered parking spaces, uh, I would see that as starting to drive incentives to make parking more shareable, publicly accessible, so that organizations are less likely to have them sit vacant for extended periods of times or have too much parking. I also, and this is the last thing I'll say because I really don't want to go over on time, I am, it was just down at UMass Amherst, and I've also seen photos of this at Rutgers. They do it out west a lot. Uh, if we start to look at uncovered parking spots as having a higher cost for impermeable surfaces, generating stormwater issues, uh, I would like to, if you cover them, being put it underneath the building or put solar panels, uh, I see those all over it and they're popping up. But we, we give a discount, meaning you would avoid the additional assessment if you cover your university mall parking lot with solar panels, which would also provide shields, shelter from the rain, the snow, the cold, and so on, but it would dual purpose our impermeable surfaces, and I'd rather see more solar panel fields come pop up over our parking lots than in our green fields throughout Vermont. So I'm, I'm really interested in looking at ways to get, uh, have us rethink parking and to take those external costs of parking, that lost opportunity, um, and actually putting it into a pricing model through regulatory reforms, maybe at the state level, which might drive better uses of that land that we care a lot about that we want to see achieved in different ways. Too much? <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe. <laughs> All the light. Okay, do you want to go next? Uh, no, I'll uh, defer to Pass. Yeah. <laughs> to me? I yeah. <laughs> Gosh, it makes it look like senators do all I the know. talking. Um, oh, it's already on. Hi. Uh, well, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, thank you to those of you who came to my transportation equity conversation. You might hear some of the same themes. Um, but I am now putting my senator hat on and not speaking as a law school professor, but as chair of the Senate Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs Committee. Um, so. Every problem to me looks like it is related to workforce, housing, and equity. Um, and transportation is a really, really critical foundational issue um, that kind of underpins all of those. But workforce, I think, in the state right now is the indicator that tells us we have um, we have a lot of despair. We have a lot of people who can't find a foothold in the economy. Um, and we, you know, we can't get people to feel like they can make trade-offs work and actually be a um, productive part of our labor force. And if we can't do that, we can't meet our climate goals. We can't pave the roads. We don't have bus drivers. Um, I think probably a lot of you are in spaces where you are feeling the impacts of a lack of workforce in the state. Um, and, you know, that being the case, uh, our committee spent our majority of our time focused on housing um, last year with the HOME Act, and we will probably be spending a lot of time thinking about where that housing goes um, this coming session. And as I mentioned in other um, settings, that is a transportation question as well, because you can't have the conversations uh, separately. Once we actually build the housing we need in critical human habitat, our village centers and our downtowns and our neighborhood growth areas, um, you are going to see more traffic congestion unless we think of ways to actually create transportation solutions along those pop popular corridors. And we actually, you know, as we um, discussed in the small group, we have maps that show us the transportation routes that most people traverse every day in Vermont, um, crossing half the state or more to get to work in Chittenden County, for example. Um, and so, you know, infrastructure and, uh, you know, remote work are also on our minds, but there are also many people, especially with the floods now, who are somewhere else um, during the day than they are at night. And so, you know, that's a quality of life issue and it's something that we have to be thinking about. Um, you know, I, I raise equity because, um, you know, it will be no surprise to the people who sat in on my session, uh, but our population is diversifying in Vermont. Um, it, it's not as visible, uh, you know, it's not visible in this room necessarily either, but at the same time, when you um, look at our population in the state, only 3% of people over 65 identify as people of color, but 10% of the kids in our schools. And when we look at any population growth we've had, 90% of that population growth has come from people of color. Um, and so when 
you look at these stark numbers and look at our workforce, that is the only area where the workforce is going to grow. We're going to have a very diverse workforce. But how safe are they and how able are they to get from A to B in our state is going to be a bigger and bigger question. Um, I don't think it's irrelevant to this conversation that we have a real policing problem in the state with the over-incarceration and uh, over-policing of black men. So in a place like Bennington, 75% of all people pulled over in a given year were black men. Um, in places like uh, Brattleboro, you, have, you are nine times more likely to be pulled over as a, as a black man. That doesn't make people want to visit our state, and it certainly doesn't make people want to stay here. And that is going to be a challenge for all of us, um, cutting potential short of young people who would like to stay in the state and um, making people feel safe to, to travel. Um, you know, as we uh, talked about, again, in our small group, public transportation is a bit fraught if you don't speak English. Um, if you don't fit into our culture, um, you know, it's, it's a very specific experience and we really have to work to make it more accessible to everyone because those are the majority of, um, you know, customers who are trying to get somewhere to work and don't have access to a vehicle. Um, you know, certainly what Senator Chittenden said about uh, free fare, I think, is part of that universal design that would be really helpful to end that, you know, people needing to find coins or get the right card and having that experience um, as they access public transportation. But, um, you know, I think one of the main ideas that I'm going to be putting forward this session um, has to do with our designation program. So we have De designation areas for development, downtowns, village centers, neighborhood growth areas, et cetera. Um, we don't have one that, that is shaped like a transit route. They're all, you know, core housing areas or development areas around maybe a river or, you know, a downtown that might not be safe to, to build things in anymore. And we need to start thinking about how do we really want to plan in our existing transportation corridors like Route 7, like the Barry Montpelier Road, the places we know we'd like to see the right kind of development and not not to pick on South Burlington, but, you know, graffiti-covered pizza huts. Um, you know, we really want to make sure the development can happen there and that it happens more quickly. Thank you. Emily, you ready? Sure. Uh, so I uh, represent one-fifth of South Burlington, and uh, the district that I represent, uh, we are very fortunate to have a lot of access to public um, transportation. Um, I can walk to uh, a bus route, but where I see some of the gaps is in the work that I actually do outside of the session um, with uh, our low-income seniors and folks um, at, at the food shelf in South Burlington who are really struggling. I, I talked about earlier, if you have a, a senior who's trying to get somewhere and they get dropped off, but it's still two miles, you know, or a mile uh, away from where they need to be for, you know, someone in their 70s that, or 80s that doesn't really work. It also uh, goes into our public safety. I, I talk to folks who, who don't feel comfortable sometimes being dropped off. I have neighbors who um, have decided to stop taking public transportation because of some of those issues. Um, and then also about uh, access and accessibility to services. Uh, folks uh, in my community are really struggling um, to make that work right now, to get to where they need to go. Uh, so I serve on the parallel, the upstairs committee to Senator Rom Hinsdale. Um, so we work on uh, housing, labor, and social um, justice is in our portfolio as well, and they all are, are really inextricably linked to transportation as well. Um, I truly believe that uh, transportation is uh, human service and should be thought of such and put in that silo and bucket um, with, obviously, we are chronically underfunding our transportation services and how we can continue to boost that and looking at other silos in government that could um, boost our transportation services. So I'd love to look into that. Um, as far as affordable housing, which is a focus uh, of a committee I serve on in South Burlington, um, 
the number one question when I talk to folks who are looking for affordable housing is about transportation. Is it on a bus line? Um, you know, am I able to get to services? So I, I think just looking at how we can improve um, some of those questions, workforce development, I meet with business owners um, all over Chittenden County all the time and they're obviously really struggling um, to find housing for their workforce. So uh, this session I plan to um, work with folks on my committee about seeing where we can improve on workforce housing, uh, farm worker housing, disability housing, and kind of going after some of those groups that are, are struggling uh, more to find housing, and also um, just building on the work of, of S100 and, and seeing what more we can do. So I'm looking forward to working on that. Yeah, thank you. Kate? Yes, I just wanted to say, you know, we have uh, 75 years of designing uh, our built environment around cars and vehicular movement um, using personal vehicles. And, you know, it's going to take time to unwind from that. Um, a couple of things that are um, of, of note, the state is working on a revamp of the state highway standards, which has not happened since 1997, so stay tuned for that. It's, it's, we've devoted uh, considerable resources to that effort, so um, it's being done um, uh, very well, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that some great things come out of that that we can begin to implement in our communities. But I wanted to say that in the meantime, um, I think that public transit is um, an excellent way that we can all begin to um, get started on putting bicycle and pedestrian and um, uh, um, other multimodal users on a, a more of a par with, with cars um, in our public rights of ways. Um, these can be um, uh, small strategic interventionist um, um, uh, um, actions that we can take in our uh, um, municipally owned rights of ways and also in our state right of ways um, to kind of set the stage for uh, the uh, some of the things that the uh, other members of this panel have been talking about building uh, income diverse housing that is affordable and convenient. Uh, to good jobs um, and uh, allows for more active lifestyles, which uh, you know deliver um, equity on uh, many levels, um, including um, public health and promote socialization, which I think is um, incredibly uh, Im important in uh, the time that we live in, particularly those um, just very casual encounters with someone that you may not even really know, but. Uh, personally, but you, you know to nod at or smile at, um, that can really make um, a great deal of difference um, as we learn more about the devastation of, um, that social isolation uh, creates in the lives of many Vermonters. Thanks. Um, just, does anyone have a follow-up? Did anybody, did that trigger any additional thought for any of you? I mean, I'm sure it did, but <laughs> anything else you want to add, I'll say. No, not on that, okay. Um, um, yeah, what advice do you have for folks that want to advocate? Like how do they, what's the best way to engage either with their legislators or with the legislature? Um, and I, hopefully you say something consistent. So, or Emily, did you yeah, want to start? I'll start. This time we'll start. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite question. Oh, good. Because it's why I ran for office was to uh, get more folks engaged in process. And so I spent um, eight years working as an assistant in the State House. So I'm the one who often would get the emails, the phone calls, um, do the outreach, um, set up events across the state. And um, I think we will all agree that the best way that you can uh, affect change with your legislators and talk to them, or any legislator really, is a phone call, a personal email, those always get the most attention. We love to see all emails, the forum emails, you know, other things, but nothing is greater. I just had a constituent today who just moved to South Burlington reach out and ask if I wanted to go for a walk this week. And that just, that, this is no, that makes my day because that is the best kind of connection 
I can't wait to welcome them to South Burlington. I can't wait to talk about what's important to them, a cup of coffee, any kind of one-on-one -on -one meeting. And you let me know if any of your reps ever say no to that, let me know and I'll, I'll ask why. Because that is just the, the best form of connecting and, and I love doing that with, with folks. Um, so please reach out to us at any point. We are there January through May, but I know we are all year round um, talking to folks like we are right now. And uh, so I would just encourage you to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, as well as one other thing I'll add is uh, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic was that how we now have co our committees are live streamed. You can testify via Zoom. So if there's an issue that's important to you, reach out to your rep and they can connect you with what committee that you might want to testify with. And um, you can do it from work or home or anywhere because it, it's really not very accessible for folks across the state to come into the state house and testify during the day and leave work. So this is just such a, a great resource that we have now. So I would encourage um, folks to do that as well. We'd love to hear from you and have you sit in on a committee. Anybody want to add anything to that? Um, I, I will just say two things specific to the moment that we're in. Um, number one, I think, I, I, you know, I just talked to the pro tem yesterday. Senators can be in different places, but this session is very much going to be focused on flood recovery, climate resilience, and climate workforce. Um, and, you know, fitting your concerns, telling the stories of how your work relates to um, you know, a, a climate resilient future and how you've helped people who are currently in despair, who we're going to be really focused on this session, um, who were impacted by the flood or are experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, we really have to prioritize what we're doing and focus on those who've been most impacted. Um, I, it's weird to look around, you know, in my 30s and realize I'm one of the only legislators left who served after Tropical Storm Irene. Um, but I keep trying to remind people that this winter is going to be brutal. Um, people will have frayed social networks and options for, um, you know, those who've been displaced. So many of those folks are feeling forgotten right now, um, but it, they will be our biggest priority in, in the Senate, in my committee, and probably in the legislature. Two, if you look at every global conflict happening around the world, um, you know, they're heartbreaking, they're devastating, and they have an impact on fuel prices. Um, and so we often, as we talked about the clean heat standard, this what was, affordable heat standard, I forget what we called it, but um, you know, as we've been talking about our transition away from fossil fuels, we don't have enough partners in the public talking about the hidden costs of a fossil fuel-based economy. Not even hidden, but in plain sight, but nobody has anyone to blame in Vermont. Um, you know, so when the cost of fuel goes up and we're spending billions more dollars in the state on our fossil fuel-based economy, um, we're, we're still having people scared of what we might do that's much more predictable in a renewable energy economy. Um, so, you know, finding and illuminating the, the cost that we will be facing at the gas pump um, and in our fuel prices uh, so that we can be having a real conversation apples to apples about the investments that we need to make in the future economy and how that compares to the very real and volatile expenses that we have no control over that we're facing in a fossil fuel economy. Follow-up question. If someone uh, does want to testify and they uh, contact the legislator to get on an agenda, any tips for their testimony? Like what, what is most effective for the committees that you're on? Or maybe for you individually? I'll, I'll field that. And, um, so I love follow-up documentation. So when you're coming in, if you can uh, also in advance. So if you can put your testimony in, in writing so that there's something to go back to. Um, some uh, verbal testimony is great, but having to rewatch YouTubes over and over again can be difficult. So if our committee assistants are fabulous, but as much concise uh, I love one-pagers with key points as well as references where you can dive deeper, but su supplying that for quick reference for making the argument after your testimony is always appreciated by me. Anything to add to that? Or? 
I mean, maybe I'm the opposite. I like really <laughs> big ideas and infographics. Um, but, you know, I would say really big ideas and then some specifics to back them up. We're talking about sponge cities in China. We're talking about, you know, in my presentation, I highlighted how the entire country of Japan post-World War II developed around children being able to walk to school. Um, you know, I love Hawaii's model of everyone should be able to access the mountains to the sea. Like, share some really big principles because this is a time where we need to think big and bold, but then we need the actual information to back it up because we have very few staff. Um, so, you know, just come with your best ideas. In my committee, everything is on the table. We need to rethink what we've been doing for the last 50 years um, as we relook at Act 250 and where we should be building and what flood resilience looks like. Um, and so we're taking any and all ideas. We just need some of the specifics to back them up. Okay. I just want to make a, a little plug uh, along those, those lines for our fantastic advocate community that we have in Vermont, because we really, we don't have staff. Um, and so a lot of these uh, big initiatives that happen, happen very much with um, a lot of assistance from um, our partner advocates. So, um, it, it, you know, that's a way to amplify your voice and your concerns in the legislature is by, um, you know, um, finding partners that you um, uh, can support and, and whose mission you agree with and, and um, supporting them f financially and, um, and, and maybe getting involved in, um, with things like testimony um, and other um, uh, outreach. And if I could just add one thing, um, I would also say when, if my, some advice, I guess, is when you, if you're, you know, running a company or owner of a company, have an employee, ask them if they want to come in, someone who's being really affected by the issue that you're dealing with people with lived experience is how you're going to move the needle, at least in my eyes, to the legislators, because, um, not that we don't want to hear from everyone, but finding those folks who really are um, living the issue that you're advocating for is really helpful to my colleagues, I think, and, and to me to, to hear and, and feel that experience. So I, I would strongly recommend that as well when you're thinking about um, what, what you're coming in to advocate for. So if you don't have anything else to add, maybe I'll open it up for some questions if you're game for that. Sure. Any questions from the audience? I know now you're afraid to be between us and the end, right? <laughs> but, but this is your chance. Ask them now. Don't be shy. Oh, oh Clayton maybe has a question. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I was really excited to hear uh, Representative Krasnow talk about transportation as a human service. Uh, my name is Clayton. I'm the general manager of Green Mountain Transit. And I spent a career in human services before coming to GMT, and, and that is a statement that I've been saying uh, all year, is that transportation is a human service. The, and the reason why I bring this up is because in the last uh, st uh, state department that I worked in, uh, the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, <clears throat> um, that department provided about half a billion dollars a year uh, to services that are being provided out in our, in our communities. And it's all great services. It's, I'm not saying that they're wasting it at all. But the thing that I just want to point out is, is that I remember being there and having transportation always be one of the major barriers for the people that we were trying to help. And then when I think about the impact of even just a few million dollars extra for public transit, I think we really need to break down this silo between hey, there's a transportation committee, there's a human services committee, and an understanding that there's a bigger connection there than people think. So not a question, but just a comment, and, <laughs> and thank you so much for seeing it that way. Absolutely, thank you so much. Yeah. Who's next? Don't be shy. In the back. Um, in Vermont's tiny uh, population and uh, compact land use patterns mean that for a lot of us, the streets where we live, work, play, go to school, are often state roads, state highways. I'm from Middlebury, which is like ground zero for that particular pattern. 
Um, and a lot of the times we, a lot of the time we find that uh, changing those streets to benefit living, working, playing, going to school is in direct conflict with state policy as far as transportation goes. I'd love to hear what the panel has to say about how we can get the state and local communities pulling in the same direction. Um, I can take a first stab at that. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, the highway, the state highway standards are being revised, um, which hasn't happened since 1997. So they are incredibly out of date. Um, and right now, uh, one, one of the main challenges that we face, uh, particularly in more of our rural communities, is um, uh, the inability to. Um, cost-effectively and in a, uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing and functional way um, restore walking and biking ability in those kinds of settings. Um, and, you know, um, the municipalities, uh, the, the way that, that uh, this gets happens on town roads, that kind of hangs off of you know, what the state allows and um, authorizes. So it, it has a, a very um, kind of pernicious effect that is dampening our ability to make progress. So that is, the good news is that is being addressed. Um, you know, it is going to take some time though, but um, it's a public process. And um, Middlebury has done, I think, phenomenal work in uh, kind of repurposing, um, used, seizing upon the opportunity with the train coming in and needing to make some changes um, to kind of repurpose your, uh, uh, center there, and um, uh, you know, again, you know, as M M uh, Senator Krasno, I'm sorry, Representative Krasno was <laughs> maybe next year. <laughs> your next, uh, your next uh, <laughs> office, uh, was saying, um, you know, getting involved in in uh, letting us speaking to that sort of lived experience of what's working in your communities and and what isn't. This is an opportune time to deliver some of that um, kind of uh, personal testimony to. Um, Senate or House and or both uh, committees. Thank you. I can add a little bit to that. I, I do serve on Senate Transportation, and this does come up regularly, and I, I think we could do better. I will also say VTrans does a great job. VTrans is very accessible, and I'm looking at Michelle Boomhauer over here. Uh, and I, I would like to uh, maybe find better ways for the state to give more deference to communities with a great deal of planning and zoning. Not all communities are the same, and they have differing levels of capabilities, competencies, and available uh, as, as professionals. But there are the Shelburns who uh, know, know what they want their Route 7 to look like through their stretch. and so. Uh, uh, there are other senators from across the state. Uh, Senator Harrison is also very interested. And in the last T-bill, we're looking at getting a, a collection, a better organized view of all the complete streets efforts throughout the state. So there might be more templates that the VTrans can then systematically adopt. But, but I definitely take your point, and it's something we need to do better at. If I could just say, I mean, this is a, a little bit of an aside, but I'll relate it back. When we did, on my committee toured Johnson after the flood, and we heard from the town administrators in Johnson, when Wolcott was underwater, we had no idea. When we were underwater, Cambridge had no idea we were underwater. I mean, the, the lack of regionalization of emergency services and planning was so apparent in these communities that felt completely isolated, didn't know who to call, had no idea what to do for several days after the flood. And it's hard to hear that, you know, we really tried to put the right communication plans and phone trees and emergency operations together after Irene, um, but we have some serious gaps. And the conversation about where we need to have new spillways and floodplains um, upstream from a community that's impacted right in their downtown is going to take regional conversation. Um, when you look at the, what we hope to be a kind of linked conversation in the legislature, we're talking about which areas to preserve into perpetuity as critical wildlife habitat and open space forever, while we talk about where to build housing and where to have our major transportation corridors. Um, and those just, they, they need to be regional conversations. There's just no way around it. Um, and our, when we create these, when we've created these designation programs, they were very narrowly focused on where commercial activity should take place, and Charlie knows this really well. Um, now we need to talk about where should housing take place, where should transit-oriented housing be built. So 
as we look at our designation programs, we're hoping that they do a lot more, to Senator Chittenden's point, to deduplicate. That someone can't look at a really good project right on a transportation corridor and say, I will see you in the Supreme Court twice, and I will fight this project for the next 10 years, and it will now be so <laughs> unaffordable it can't happen. Um, so, you know, we as a, as the state have to take responsibility for that. We asked local government to do a lot last session, and I will keep raising Act 250 as, you know, an area where we need to let communities that are ready to give them the tools to be ready and then let them manage these processes but still have regional decision making capacity that frankly unfortunately I don't think Act 250 or the state is doing well enough right now. Thank you for that. Question a couple questions there. Hi hey there. Uh, Jamie Smith, University of Vermont Transportation Parking. Uh, I'm only about six months into this job. I've worked in a couple of different areas, though. I've worked in public transportation. I've worked in K-12 schools for one of the largest K-12 school districts here in Vermont, and now here at the university. One theme that I have seen through all of these, um, and that I've heard in a lot of our sessions today, is a lack of workforce, in particular CDL drivers. In the last five years or so, I've seen more hurdles go in place into attracting and training CDL drivers. Uh, Vermont legalizes cannabis. Um, we've added uh, national training requirements, all of which are good from a safety perspective, don't get me wrong. But the barriers for someone to get into that workforce and have it be a good paying job as well uh, is pretty significant. You know, we're talking three to three months to six months in some cases for somebody, there's a lot of places where people can fall off of that. And I, I'm just wondering, or, or maybe just imagining, or maybe it's just something for an, a nugget of thought to, to think about, how do we break down those barriers? How do we create a better path to that workforce and, and make CDL driving a, a good paying job? Uh, one thing I might suggest, I mean, Vermont has uh, a police training academy Right? We train people for a highly skilled position that takes, that we expect a lot of skills for. I don't know if that's the right answer for Vermont, but are there, are there things like that we could think about where we take this training burden off of the small school districts and the, you know, the smaller employers and perhaps get you know, some, some workers into the workforce? Okay. So as the new, relatively new chair of economic development, Anything related to workforce, I'm just trying to claim because it hasn't had a real home. So, for example, you know, someone came to me from a human services role and said, we don't have any driver's ed teachers. That program has moved to New Hampshire and it doesn't train people well. And, you know, so there I was trying to get someone from the education committee and the transportation committee and the appropriations mm -hmm. committee to have this conversation with me because workforce just simply, it is cross-cutting, but when it's cross-cutting, it almost lives nowhere. Um, so, you know, raising that issue to people like me and Senator Chittenden, let's do something about it. Um, you know, we have an issue with our state colleges where we're trying to figure out how they can add value and do more certification programs um, and, and be useful, you know, in all ways to the Vermont economy. Um, so no idea is off the table at this point. We're having the same issue with EMS, with um, you know, emergency services. So we're really close to the brink with a lot of systems that we can't have fail. Um, and everyone sees that in the legislature, but you know, it was literally like an EMS representative from Brattleboro just saying, I am creating a training program. I need a, a million dollars. So, you know, we can't, we can't build it, but we can fund it. Um, so I think we're willing to take any good idea and try to run with it, especially as it relates to workforce, because that's really bringing the economy to its knees. Do you want to add anything? Not good. Oh, really quick, I can say this came up last session, and I, one thing I did hear, and I, I believe we're working on it, is to have more frequent CDL training and also mobile units so that it's just making it more convenience, convenient for a trainer to go up on site to different parts of the state uh, and uh, to offer more of those in person, as well as online training, so a lot of these things can be done in, uh, more frequently throughout the year. But we welcome exactly to Senator Rom Hinsdale's point. What, you're on the ground. You see this. What could the state do better to make it easier? I'm all ears. Thanks for that. Another question there? 
Hi, um, I'm Claire Nelson with the Transportation Research Center. I had a question about the using car registration fees um, to fund transit. It occurs to me that we're in a state where not everybody has access to transit, and so I'm wondering how that's come up in conversation about at, um, you, your face says a lot. Okay. Yeah, so that's <laughs> kind of where it stalled out. Um, so there's, uh, there's yes. parts of Vermont that don't have public transit, and so why should they pay, pay $10 fee? My counterpoint to that is those people that live throughout Vermont drive throughout all of Vermont. They, they drive in Burlington, they drive through Richmond, they drive through Brattleboro, and they have experienced traffic and congestion. So if they want to be part of the solution. But I also, uh, I don't know if, how many of you know how a Green Mountain Transit is funded, but there are nine uh, subscribing communities that are assessed every year uh, that pay. So Williston, South Burlington, Shelburne, uh, so they get a bill. So South Burlington, uh, the city, pays about $550,000 last year, something like that. That's like $25 per resident because they're part of that solution. Uh, so my point is that I would be supportive of a path where if you are already in a community that your property taxes are subsidizing public transportation, it is not that far-fetched, and I'm looking at Michelle again, uh, to dynamically configure and have a $10 fee be incurred if you are in a community that is served by public transit but not currently paying into a system to, to do it. So it could be a variable rate based on the address of registration. Uh, there's ways to make this dynamic. We are, as uh, the VTrans bill recently passed, going to be looking at variable car registration fees for hybrids, electric cars, and so on to, to fill the hole of reduced gas tax revenues, which is what we, we want. And so I think the conversation about variable car registration fees on certain conditions, you can do that. It's, uh, as my friend Mike Austin would say, a simple matter of programming. So to your point, that is absolutely hesitation. Uh, there's resistance to have everybody in the state subsidize public transit. But if we want to have less cars on the road, less traffic congestion when you travel throughout the state, this is one rational way Way, I would argue to, to subsidize it. But maybe you don't do the entire state. Maybe you do areas that are served by public transit, but in communities that might not necessarily currently um, contribute. Can I say something? Yeah. So, like, the mover in southern Vermont, I don't know if anybody's here from the mover, and um, I met Amanda from Capstone doing the rural Uber, and I forget what it's actually called. Um, we're going to have to rethink public transportation in a rural setting as well, and most of the people who can't get to the grocery store, a doctor's appointment, are in rural areas. You know, that's part of their challenge is energy poverty, no, no access to a car, not able to drive those long distances by themselves. Um, so if we're, you know, I sit on finance too, if we're going to fund this kind of stuff, it has to work for all of Vermont. And it's not going to necessarily be, you know, a big bus going from Burlington to Montpelier, but it has to be you know, those solutions where you're getting people back to work, driving their neighbors to a doctor's appointment or substance use treatment, or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, you, we're gonna have to really look at those rural solutions as well, and that's the way we get more of our colleagues on board, I think, but, you know, what do I know? <laughs> you know how to get the votes. <laughs> um, any last question? We're just about at 4.15. Oh, yeah. oh representative. Hi, um, so uh, this morning I dropped my girlfriend off to take the Ethan Allen Express. Um, we're both big rail riders. Um, I'm wondering if the legislators have any thoughts on the future of passenger rail in the state of Vermont. Well, I just know that Senator Chittenden loves trains and it looks like he was ready to talk about it. So I just wanted to give him that intro. <laughs> I, I, do, I do love trains and I, I love, um, so the Vermonter too is great. Uh, so two thoughts. Uh, one, and I have raised this with Amtrak and there are sound implications, but I, I think we need to um, uh, consider uh, expanded service uh, being, how many of you have ever taken a red eye train or oh, red eye oh, plane? plane, plane. Yeah. So it, it sometimes works, and a lot of colleagues that I work with, when you need to get on at 9.30 a.m. and get off the, in New York City at 4 p.m., you've lost the whole day. So I, I, I think there's a way with Amtrak to have a, a, a night run, which can move the, but that's talking with Amtrak, and then we have trains going through Vermont at uh, earlier hours, so it might be at a slower pace so as to not disturb things. The second thing is, I was very lucky last, this past summer to be spend time over in Europe with a family. Uh, I loved everything in Europe, trains everywhere, always had a family rate. I was traveling with three kids. Uh, I, as a 
father with three kids and a spouse, when I want to go to Ethan Allen, it would literally cost me about $375 in train tickets to take the family down to New York City, as opposed to $80 in gas, and I'd save time driving in my car. So we, we need to make the economic calculus more attractive for group rates, and I would like, and I've expressed this to Amtrak, Amtrak should offer family group bundles, uh, just like they do in Europe, so that it makes more sense, rather than to take the minivan to get everybody, which also has less transactional cost when one person pays for five tickets and you're dealing with one person. So those are two thoughts that come to mind. I'd be welcoming of others. Thanks for that. I, I just did, wanted to say really quickly that the, oh. um, uh, the train is soon, we think, going to be going all the way up to Montreal. Um, and so, the, the, so, so what is the, the holdup? Um, it's, it's Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are ready. Right We're direction. just waiting on Canada. So um, it's going to get worked out you know, before too long. And so we are gonna have service from New York City up to Montreal, which will be awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, we're at 4.15. Oh, I've, can we take one more? We can take one more. Can we? Who do you got? No, sorry, Representative. Yeah, I'd love to hear. Um, I'm not up on that, <laughs> but I am also a state rep um, for the town of Essex and um, part of the city of Essex Junction. My name's Leonora Dodge. I'm a new legislator, and um, I just really want to just take this quick moment to introduce myself because um, I'm probably one of the few uh, native bilingual Spanish speakers in the um, in the house, and and uh, in that given that Spanish is the second most common language spoken in this state, uh, and a massively growing population, um, I really would like to hear from anybody who has connections uh, beyond Chittenden County, I, I feel like I have gotten to know a lot of the folks, um, to, to be a voice um, and to, to connect with, with our, our representatives and our senators. I think that um, we are all here you know, as activists and um, movers and shakers in the, in the state, um, but it's really important for us to survey as much as possible and get, you know, I really liked uh, Michael Monti's reporting of, you know, let's think about our policies. You spent a lot of time talking about what residents in affordable housing units actually want. And, um, and I think that we can fall into traps as legislators where we only hear from the people who have a big microphone. So I would love to um, make sure that we hear from all kinds of folks. Thank you for that. I think we're over time now, so I'm going to call it. And thank you very much to our legislators. And uh, really you. appreciate it. And thank you all to you, all of you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>